Hey guys, all right, we are back with another potential history video. This time, the Bismarck, the German big oof, oof, big ol' oof. Uh, so, uh, meme ships is what we're doing. Um, curious what he's going to say. Uh, I know very little about the Bismarck, except for it was supposed to be an intimidating ship. It was supposed to be, like, very threatening, but it from what I've heard from a different historian on social media is he said it lacked certain technological capabilities that a front of the line, you know, battleship should have like certain targeting systems. I think it lacked, um, compared to the British counterparts. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. We're just going to go ahead and enjoy potential history explaining to me about the Bismarck. Battleship, Milton Bradley's great game of strategy. Please help. Loaded with action and suspense. Play it anytime, anywhere. Battleship's fun. It's a fun board game. A game of oh. Would you even call that a board game? I don't know. I like to call it the Germans big after the Treaty of Versailles in 1918, Germany's armed forces were stripped to a bare minimum, and a lot is talked about how the Army and Air Force were built back up very quickly. But the same is also true of the Kriegsmarine, or German Navy. Being left with few ships in the interwar period, the Germans hurriedly built many battleships that would later take part in the upcoming war in the Atlantic. The crown jewel of the- Yes, so what Germany had from World- What they had before the end of World War One, or at the start of World War One in 1914, Germany had the second most formidable navy in the entire world. The United States Navy, it was it was up there. It was a strong, powerful navy for what the United States had. But it still was not as powerful as the British and the Germans. The Germans were trying to catch up to the British um, uh, post, I think, 1880s, maybe post 1890 was around the time when the naval race started. Uh, at first, Britain was not taking Germany seriously whatsoever. They were like, God, oh, they'll never catch up. And then Germany started building some big-ass ships, and Britain got scared, and I actually started then to build up Navy as well. I don't think the naval arms race really ended until 1909, is I think when tension started to cool a little bit on the arms ra naval race. Can't remember. It's been a while since I looked this up. But, uh, yeah... Uh, 1914, Germany had the second most strong, second strongest navy in the world, second only to the British, who had been the nave, naval dominant force for centuries by this point. Uh, or well, at least for a century. Um, so, uh, anyways, shut up. These See ships you. that was first laid in 1936 and completed in 1941 was the gigantic battleship Bismarck, commanded by Captain Otto Ernst Lindemann. The battleship at the time of its creation was one of the largest and most advanced of the time, boasting ridiculous speeds, thick armor, and a litany of thick. guns, including eight 15-inch guns housed in four turrets. Very understandably, the launch of this ship made the British very nervous, as on paper it looked like it had the potential to be an unstoppable beast in the Atlantic. As a result, the British tried to keep eyes on it from the day it launched. Its first actual combat mission began on the evening of May 19, 1941, where when leaving port with its escort ship Prince Eugen, it is immediately photographed by a British plane with the information relayed back to the Royal Goddamn that's the Bismarck. She thick. Navy. Oh, off to a good start already. Now, although the Bismarck was a battleship killer, this was not its mission on its maiden voyage. Much more of a threat to Germany than British battleships was British merchant shipping which is what had kept Britain in the war so far. The Germans figured that if Bismarck could head north, through the Denmark Strait, around England, near Iceland, and into the Atlantic undetected, it could wreak havoc on British ships bringing supplies to Great Britain. However, this begins to go awry almost immediately. As mentioned before, Bismarck was spotted as it left port at the beginning of its mission. This caused several British ships, including the HMS Hood, the pride of the Royal Navy, and the HMS Prince of Wales, to steam towards the Strait to intercept the Bismarck. It's yeah, so... Another thing that I have with the Bismarck, it's so fucking huge, it's not going to be able to stay hidden. That's why uh, 
U-boat warfare was so effective for the Germans in World War I and in World War II, and why the U-boats were such a threat is because they were practically undetectable. It took a lot of effort to hunt them down. The Bismarck will not take effort to hunt it down. You can send a few ships, uh, planes up in the sky, and you'll be able to probably find it within the day. It can be fast, but it's so big, it's going to be easily spotted. And also, battleships will have escort groups. Because you don't want a battleship. A big chonker battleship. Just like you don't want a big chonker carrier. Even though they have formidable defenses themselves. Especially modern day carriers. You still don't want to leave them unescorted. They, you, they need support ships. So you're going to find the Bismarck easily. I, the Bismarck... I. Personally, I think from the beginning it was a stupid plan. They should have just fo should have just been a focus on submarines. The, Germany has the submarines are cheaper, they're smaller, so you could produce a lot more of them. So why waste the time building such a thick bitch here? <laughs> It's also worth mentioning that Linderman did not fully fill his fuel tanks before departure, and a lot of people oh, point to this as a big mistake. It's actually not that dumb, as there were several German oil tankers in the North Atlantic where he planned to refuel, and the advantage of leaving with full tanks was negligible compared to the advantage of leaving sooner in hopes of not being spotted, although that obviously didn't work out. On May 24th, yeah. after sailing north and around Iceland, German lookouts spotted the Hood and Prince of Wales under the command of Vice Admiral Holland. Once within range, the Hood began firing upon the Prince Eugen, mistaking it for the Bismarck while Prince of Wales fired correctly at Bismarck. Prince Eugen returned fire immediately, with the Bismarck beginning to do so a few minutes later. Prince Eugen was ordered to target the Prince of Wales to keep both opponents under fire, as the Bismarck targeted the Hood. However, it is at this point that the Bismarck ran into another problem. The Germans had equipped the Bismarck with advanced radar systems to aid in the range finding for her main guns. The radar system itself was located right next to one of the gun turrets. In one of the first salvos fired at the Hood, the concussion from the guns damaged the relay of these range Rangefinders, so from this point on, the gunners could not rely on them for sighting. Oh my god. <laughs> Oof. Rip. After firing the several chat. salvos, one of Bismarck's shells managed to land through the hood's rear deck and detonate her magazine, sinking it in about two so minutes, a lucky hit. taking all but three of her 1,419-man crew with her. After this, both German ships continued to fire on the Prince of Wales, which was heavily damaged losing her bridge in the fight along with her officers. This was not before the Prince of Wales struck a hit on the Bismarck, entering towards the bow near the deck line and exiting on the other side near the water line. The Prince of Wales retreated to safety, but Linderman realized the shell had punctured one of the oil tanks, and Bismarck was now leaking oil into the ocean. Now this isn't a huge problem for most ships, but remember, the Bismarck is trying to move stealthily, and it now has a giant oil slick trailing behind it, giving away its position to any potential aircraft above. After the battle, Bismarck reported that it had sunk one ship, mostly likely the hood, and heavily damaged another. Linderman also reported the damage to the Bismarck and his intentions to head for ports in France to make repairs and to detach Prince Eugen to keep the mission going. Now after the sinking of the hood, the Royal Navy doubled its efforts to take down the Bismarck. However, at this point, its position had been lost and the British ships giving chase actually began to move in the wrong direction, thinking it was heading huh. north. When all seemed lost though, the Bismarck's commander decided to radio Berlin in a somewhat incoherent ramble about their dire situation, in a message that was picked up by British ships and was able to be used to find the Bismarck's position. Shortly after this, the Bismarck's oil slick was spotted by a British seaplane, and the chase was back on. However, British ships in the Atlantic were too far away to be able to catch. Holy shit, it traveled far. <laughs> wow. Went up to Bergen, then north of Iceland. Wow. Oh, spoiler alert, the Bismarck sinks? Man. Potential history, you just spoiled it for me, Catch man. It in time, and ships from the Mediterranean were ordered out and north to intercept the ship before it could get to France. This group, called Force H, contained the aircraft carrier Ark Royal, carrying a number of obsolete swordfish torpedo planes. Knowing he could not catch up to the Bismarck with his ships in time, Admiral James Somerville decided to launch his planes in an attempt to stall the Bismarck so that the battleships could catch up. Now, this attack is a literal David and Goliath scenario. The Bismarck had many anti-aircraft guns on it, and the swordfish were very slow, open-top biplanes. Despite this, though, no swordfish were taken out in the battle, and one of their torpedoes managed to actually damage the Bismarck's rudder, making it dead in the water. And the whole battle is a meme in itself. <laughs> if you want to know more about how none of the swordfish were taken out, check out Military History Visualized video on the battle. I fear no man, but that thing...
Now with the rudder jammed, the Bismarck was now moving in a large circle, unable to escape the oncoming British force, which included the battleships King George V, the Rodney, and heavy cruisers Dorsetshire and Norfolk. Following a few skirmishes, the King George V led an attack on the 27th of May, where it and Rodney began the engagement from far off. I'm out of Bismarck footage, so here's a CG depiction. <laughs> and as the battle continued, with the Norfolk and Dorchestershire beginning to fire when within range. The Bismarck attempted to fire back, but to no real effect. Due to the Bismarck's thick armor on her hull, the British guns were having little effect there. They began to target the superstructure of the ship. And this is where we get to the biggest irony of the battle. Bismarck was such a huge and well-armored ship that this advantage ended up almost being a disadvantage to her in her last moments. Because she couldn't sink, her decks began to be shelled and her sailors dodged artillery fires if they were infantry tree on land. Congratulations, you played <laughs> yourself. One by one, Bismarck's gun turrets went silent, and enough damage was eventually done to the ship that it rolled over and later sank. And I know there's a whole debate over whether or not British guns or German scuttling took down the ship. I've heard convincing arguments for both, and I don't think there's anything I could really add to that conversation. I will say, though, that regardless of who dealt the actual killing, sinking blow, the ship had been combat ineffective for a while now, and the whole argument seems kind of pointless to me. Once sunk, <laughs> some of the Bismarck's crew were picked up by the British ships. Although, before all were grabbed, it is thought that a U-boat was spotted far off, and the British ships had to withdraw, leaving a significant portion of the survivors in the water to drown. Now, I had not read much about- What? Oh, that's fucking horrible. The war on the Atlantic previous to making this video, but it is interesting to me that the same faults found in the land war are also very present in the war on the Atlantic. First is that you have a very cost-intensive, technology-advanced weapon that can only be made in small quantities, but is created in the hope that it can kill at a high ratio. Does that sound familiar? The Bismarck to me is the epitome of the Germans putting all their eggs in one basket. Just like they do with, say, their mid to late war tank designs. And it's funny to me how pervasive the problem was. Second, the atrocious planning made for this ship on her maiden voyage. A lot of people criticize Linderman for his actions, particularly his message back to Berlin, and blame him for the issues the Bismarck had. But I don't think this is the case, though. This is another classic example of the German high command biting off more than they can chew, based on technological overconfidence. The original plan for the Bismarck Bismarck's maiden voyage was meant to involve many more ships, however these ships had been damaged previously and were still undergoing repairs when the operation was set to launch. But the Germans launched it anyway, placing all their faith in the Bismarck's ability to fight. You can even make the argument that the Bismarck itself wasn't ready for the fight as the crew had been quickly rushed through its training, and that's pretty clearly exemplified in the second half of its combat performance. Given all of these things that the Bismarck had to deal with, it looks as if it was almost sent out to die, even if that was the last intention of the German high command. Yeah, and I, I agree. think what happened was, with Barbarossa coming up in the following month, the war in the Atlantic was the last thing on the German high command's mind, but it was still a big issue. So rather than divert time and planning to correctly roll out the Bismarck, they threw it out there in an attempt to solve the problem quickly, but with no real thought put into how. And this gave the British a prime opportunity to destroy the pride of Germany while its head was turned eastward. Thanks again to World of Warships for sponsoring. Huh. I, I love potential history. That was really good. Uh, let's see. What... Let's use uh, sinking there. That's a, that's a good image. <laughs> it's blurry. Uh, yeah, this was a good video. A lot of a lot of my suspicions uh, about the Bismarck kind of confirmed through the video. You know the um poor planning, but that was kind of to be expected by the Germans of World War Two. Uh, the Nazi high command was pretty fucking piss poor at planning. But the only, like, they relied a lot on luck. Like, the invasion of France was honestly pure luck and French stupidity, French high command stupidity um, for not listening to younger voices uh, and, and doctrine and what new doctrine. But, uh, yeah, this is a good video. I have nothing more to add here at the end. Uh, Potential History covers everything really, really well in his videos. So, uh, that was the Bismarck, the German big oof. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.